when I tell you that I went into this video wanting to hate this girl because F you for doing what you did to the black community. But when I tell you that this iceberg really hit me in the feels, sis, like, damn. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mia Soros, real name Mia Kinuen, is a popular Asian American content creator. She started her channel in September 2011 as a story time slash vlog channel where she would discuss her life in graphic detail from fights to sex work to mental illness to tripping antics. Mia's channel was exactly the over embellishment of mundane activities that people had come to expect from story time YouTubers. She was once a member of the Tanamoja Trash Channel, a collaborative story time channel that boosted the fame of several content creators such as Anna Campbell, Natalia Taylor, Kaylin Berry and Kira Bridget. However, Mia would emerge as one of the more popular storytime YouTubers of the bunch as for the most part, she was entertaining and relatable. Her ramblings were nonsensical but somehow made sense and her dramatization would garner her far more on her own channel after the Tanamoja channel of trash would eventually become inoperative. Although Mia has made a name for herself as a YouTube commentator in the past two years, talking about everything from socio-political issues to celebrity, fashion houses and influencer drama, her editing style is an attack on the senses and young people enjoyed the fact that although she shared her opinion on various topics, her opinions were educated with a strong importance placed on morality, empathy, PC culture and activism. She was the woke, liberated feminist content creator who had the talent for discussing bigger issues stemming from the heinous behaviors displayed by prominent figures on social media, while still allowing it to be a fun, well-researched laugh and social commentary on the way that public figures put capitalism above a moral compass. Now, as you can see from my glowing review of Mia Soros's channel, there's actually nothing wrong with her content. The pivot in her content is synonymous with personal growth, which eventually all YouTubers do. The expectation that story time YouTubers would over embellish or stretch the truth of the stories that they would tell was pretty much just the general consensus of everybody online. So what exactly did Mia Soros do for me to create a Iceberg Explained video? Well, on the 26th of June, 2022, Mia Soros would release a video basically exposing herself as a pathological liar. I have a problem with compulsive, and pathological lying. But Paige, all storytime channels have lied in some capacity. Well, Mia Soros's lies would be more than just white lies and exaggerating the truth. Mia Soros would admit to fabricating stories completely, promoting drug culture that she herself did not do despite telling her audience that she did, lying about colon cancer, using black culture and AAVE for profit and personal gain in order to kind of blur the lines regarding her own ethnicity as a racially ambiguous woman, lying about being bipolar, as well as lying about watching a person die amongst a plethora of other things. Turns out that she was exactly the person that she was using cancel culture to leverage against. And her audience didn't care congratulating her for coming clean and applauding her honesty. But did Mia Soros deserve the kudos it is that she got from her audience? Or did Mia Soros just simply preempt her own cancellation and beat other commentators to the punch by removing years and years worth of content? As many people have saw since Mia Soros's original apology video, Yes, there have been two. No other prominent commentators besides Peter Mann have made any videos regarding Mia Soros' admission of many things that have got numerous other content creators canceled. Well, I believe that by deleting all of her previous videos that she stopped many commentators such as myself from being able to talk about her actions whilst having the resources to back up their claims. However, after searching high and low, up and down and all around the internet, I was finally able 
to locate, I'd say probably about 60 to 70% of Mia Soros' old deleted content. We're talking deleted videos and privatized videos, things that people have not been able to get their hands on, sis. I did that so that we could appropriately assess and analyze Mia's actions. Don't ask me how I found them because I'm not telling you and I am like a dog with a bone when I feel like somebody is hiding the truth. So take a walk with me as we discuss the disgusting lies of Mia Soros. Iceberg explained, but not before a few words from today's sponsor. Today's video is proudly sponsored by Magic Spoon. Now, if you don't know who Magic Spoon are, these are the people behind the most delicious and healthy cereal that kind of gives you that childlike nostalgia whilst in tandem being good for you. In the cereal, there is zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. And we all know that if you're on a keto diet, babe, we need to be locking those net carbs. And the best thing about it all is that it's a no fuss way to be able to track your calories because it is only 140 calories per serving. Now for this morning's breakfast, I sat down and ate the peanut butter flavor. I was a little bit apprehensive that it wouldn't be like sweet in flavor, but I was very, very surprised at how sweet it tasted considering it contains zero sugar. And we all know what the fundamental taste test is, is how does that milk be tasting after you've completed your bowl of cereal and babes, the milk was sensational. I decided to put Magic Spoon to the test and gave it to my two very very picky eaters and Fifi absolutely loved the chocolate flavor and so did Theodore as well in fact they ended up fighting over the bowl and who could eat the magic spoon so as far as I'm concerned it is literally the perfect option for you and your family so that you guys can start the day right without that instantaneous boost of sugar but still getting everything that is important for your body if you would like to get your hands on one of the most family friendly and picky eater child approved cereals in the world, please make sure that you go and grab yourself a variety pack and try it out today. And be sure to go over and use the promo code PageChristy at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or you can go over to www.magicspoon.com forward slash PageChristy. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for whatever reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code PageChristy for $5 off or go over to magicspoon.com forward slash PageChristy to save $5 today as it will greatly help my channel if you do. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's sponsor and without further ado, let's get straight into the video. Mia is a 22 year old YouTuber who currently resides in Helsinki, Finland. Currently studying a bachelor's degree in fashion slash apparel design at, and forgive me now, Esmod Ecole Supérieure des Arts et Techniques de la Mode. I probably butchered that. She was originally born in Singapore and briefly lived in Georgia for a few years, which would explain her Americanized accent. Her mother is of mixed Asian descent and her father is Finnish. Now out of everything when it comes to Mia, one thing I feel like she has been consistent about is her childhood trauma. I would go as far as to say that that is the only consistent story that Mia Soros has told thus far. She has made two videos on this subject that I was able to find, one titled, Get Ready With Me To See My Toxic AF Family, and the other one titled, Get Ready With Me To Eat Dinner With My Toxic Dad. Essentially, her father is a raging alcoholic. And whilst growing up, she would watch him frequently emotionally and financially and physically abuse her mother. Her life was a constant of watching her mother be abused and then police and law enforcement constantly being involved. And then her mother forgiving her father and then following him wherever he may go around the world. For instance, they lived in Dubai for a portion of her life. I actually think she started her channel while she was living in Dubai. She stated that she started her channel in that time due to the loneliness it was that she felt being so displaced away from everything it is that she knew back in Georgia. Hi, my name is Mia Keenanen. I'm 13 years old and I will be performing Olive's monologue from EZA. Whatever happened to chivalry? 
So this wasn't your average working class father is an alcoholic backstory. This would be, if there was to be a PR media spin on this, a very rich and respectable man who was suffering with alcoholism. After Dubai, it seems as if her father's alcoholism was becoming an issue. So it was requested of him to go into rehab and return to work once he'd completed the program. Her mother, unable to look after Mia, sent her to Mia's auntie on her father's side in Finland, so that she had the opportunity to go to an international English speaking school. Mia speaks about being treated horribly by them and how her auntie charged her parents 600 euros, which is agreeably extortionate for her to even stay with them, especially when she wasn't even being fed correctly. And in one of her story times, she even recalls rationing out almonds because she's vegan to eat in the morning for breakfast and she would just ration out food because when i went to go see my mom i complained to her about not eating and how i was rationing out my almonds that my mom bought me i was rationing out these almonds so that they would last me until the next time i would see my mom which is in like two weeks rationing almonds for breakfast like what so like i said my mom would give me money every single time i went to go see her and that would basically be my food money i would buy whatever with it the next thing that irks me is one day when i was on the phone with my mom she told me that i need to take shorter showers and i was like damn that's kind of weird because I don't spend that long in the shower and when I do, I make sure to turn off the water in between, you know what I'm saying? But she was like, no, your aunt says that you're racking up the bill and we're already paying her to stay with you. That's my dad's sister. Why would my dad's sister, who claims to love him so much, be asking him for rent money for a room that's already there? You know, the food bill, I understand that, like pay for my meals. She asked my dad to pay 600 euros 600 euros just so that I could stay that really rubbed me the wrong way Her auntie would constantly complain about Mia's behavior and her mother being in a situation where she was unable to look after her daughter Essentially became agreeable and told Mia to comply with whatever it was that her auntie wanted Even though it was clear that she was being abused by her father's side of the family so bad that it actually made her Develop generalized anxiety every single time that they would even be around her Like she was legitimately scared to share common spaces with them it Bothered me to the point that I started to get panic attacks just by staying around my aunt and her family because they started to like talk about me and I knew that this because they were speaking Finnish and then all of a sudden I would come into the room and they just stop. So it's kind of clear to me that her channel was born out of loneliness, which is something that fucking resonates with me. I made this channel out of the loneliness and isolation of being several hundred miles away from my family and friends. So I understood all too well how much this channel meant to her. However, whilst there may have been a moment of truthfulness where she bared her soul to her audience and told them one consistent truth, almost everything else it would be that she would tell her audience would be a lie. So, Let's get into the story time era. Mia's content online would essentially be story time content. However, her story times would be super outlandish. Like the time she almost slept with her cousin, fighting a crackhead for a Chanel bag, peeing on the Arctic monkeys, losing her virginity at the Warp Tour, as well as an incest threesome. Like the stories? I mean, we have to remember that in 2016, when this content was being created, Mia would be 16 years old. So a lot of people felt as if this kind of content was extremely mature for her demographic. Resident YouTube uncle, Mr. Peter Mon, would actually make a video about Miasaurus four years ago, basically like as a premonition of what we're seeing today. It was a video where he basically said, hey girl, this is the internet and once you put it out there, it's kind of out there forever. And Miasaurus actually responded to Peter Mon in the comment section and basically thanked him for you know, taking the time to even make a video on her. Now, obviously at 17-ish years old at the time, I'm not going to penalize her for not having the foresight to see exactly where her life would be in the future. I mean, I don't think any of us have foresight 
in our teens. But again, nobody expected that Storytime YouTubers would be telling the truth. So it came as a little bit of a surprise when Miosaurus would release two videos back to back, basically detailing her past transgressions as well as her regrets. And this came as a shock to many people in her audience as well because many people weren't aware of her past content. And why? Well, that would be because Mia would delete pretty much almost all of their story time content in May 2021. So we're talking literally everything besides her social commentary content. So last month, within two weeks of each other, Mia Soros released two apology videos. One titled, Addressing the Past Behaviour and the Black Scent. And in this video, she apologizes for numerous different things. And this is the one we're gonna be focusing on the most. Lying about doing drugs. I lied about doing drugs, by the way. Lying about having a particular mental illness. I lied about being diagnosed bipolar. Lying about having multiple sex capades. I lied about um, having multiple. The sex and adult entertainment industry. I lied about stripping. I lied about um, being a hoe. Lying about famous people such as Melanie Martinez. This entire fabricated story about fighting someone for Melanie and Martinez tickets. But the most important thing to know here is that I just lied. And the whole thing was fabricated. Lying about seeing a dead person. I lied about watching someone die. As well as not being forthcoming with her racial ambiguity and black scent. I exaggerated the way that I talked. I changed the way that I talked intentionally at times. I'm half white and half Asian. I'm not black. And to talk in a way that maybe I didn't have black people and marginalized groups in mind in me fabricating a new persona, but the consequence is still the same. I'm still adding to stigma that impacts them and worsens their lives. I want you guys to put a pin in all of the things that is that I just said because these are the main things that we are going to be focusing on and reflecting on and reviewing throughout this video. So put a pin in it. Now, despite how horrific some of her admissions were, many people had pointed out a few problems with the first apology. One of them being that although the video was titled Addressing My Past Content and The Black Scent, that she actually didn't start speaking about the black sun tissue until 30 minutes into a 38 minute video. The other one is that despite the fact that she said she wasn't going to make it about herself and her feelings, she actually did make it about herself and her feelings and spoke about her feelings frequently throughout the video. That it was wrong. Sorry, I really don't want to be that person. Jesus, that person that fucking it's not about me. It is, obviously. But it's not about how I feel. It's about I did this and it's wrong. It's wrong. I think there, there, there was that feeling of shame and embarrassment that I was almost, well, very evidently evading for many years. Moral of the story, I realized that a text post, God, this sounds so corny already. You know, I already have my own and probably people who are watching too, predispositioned beliefs about, well, I mean, I guess you can kind of categorize this into the, you know, whole subgenre that is apology videos. But, you know, you almost have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. At least I do. Because, you know, when you're making videos, it's like, I mean, you have to press record, not to like fucking over explain it, but you know, there's a lot of waiting and it's processing and you have to, you know, you practice, you know, there's a little bit of that manufactured, like, is this even genuine? And I think, you know, I don't want to be, this is really going to be really convoluted by the way, and all over the place and scattered brain uh, apologies in advance for all the people who get 
annoyed that her video wasn't very well thought through or structured and kind of haphazardly put together. Sorry, what the fuck was I going to say? And that it was so emotionally overwhelming for her that people felt like this was somewhat of a form of manipulation in order to make people feel sorry for her and not to actually feel sorry for the numerous people it is that she may have harmed with her actions. And I don't want to do that shit anymore. And I don't want to be that person. And goddamn, sorry. I want to work on that and never do that shit again. I made the wrong choice over and over again. And um, an apology means fucking nothing without me actually doing and being better. So I will work on that. Yes. Another part is because her rambling wasn't concise, many people didn't think that most people would watch a video of that length because the apologies actually didn't take place until 34 minutes into the 38 minute video. That just overall, she just missed the mark. Now this isn't my assessment, this is the assessment of the general public who had the chance to watch the video. Because Mia Soros has deleted all of her content, but we'll touch on that a little later. If you would have told me that in a post creep show art scandal YouTube space, that somebody in the commentary community could do this, and nobody is batting an eye. Like, and this person is somebody who made it their business to make their niche calling out other people's behavior. So you would think that this will get a different response, but no. The majority of Mia's audience were a mixture of confused because they had no idea what the hell was going on or being somewhat proud of Mia for being forthcoming with this information herself. Many people deeply resonated with the fact that Mia Soros was a pathological liar and other people just simply didn't know what to believe. Among all of the detestable things it is that Mia Soros had admitted to, the black scent issue was actually one that her audience were aware of and that had been brought up to Mia on several occasions. And that in the past, Mia had just completely dismissed or disregarded anybody who thought that she was appropriating a black accent. And a huge problem surrounding this particular apology video is that many of Mia Soros's predominant why audience were forgiving Mia for actions that actually didn't affect them, which was obviously her not being forthcoming with her racial ambiguity and her black scent. So here's my little educational segment on why this apology, for me at least, was possibly one of the apologies that needed to be handled with a level of care and attention. So let's talk AAVE and BBE. <laughs> African American vernacular English shares most of its grammar and vocabulary with other dialects of English, but it is distinct and different from standard English compared to any other dialect spoken in North America. African American English is actually a form of standard English and can be considered as the common dialect of African Americans. However, African American English isn't the only dialect of English. There's been various different dialectal formations of English since the 17th century when English became widespread around the world. There is American English, British English, Canadian English, Australian English, etc, etc. However, the difference between all of those aforementioned versions of English and AAVE is that AAVE is not a national dialect. AAVE is a precious product of the people who mastered the language under the inhumane conditions of slavery. As a result of having to adopt a completely new and unfamiliar language quickly as a way of survival. 15th century African slaves developed a pidgin that continues to persist within the present black community. 
a form of pidgin language that possesses all of the normal rules of English whilst ridding itself of all of the superficial aspects of the language. In Britain, we use BBE, which is Black British English. As the majority of Black people from the United Kingdom are either African or of Caribbean descent, namely Jamaican. And Jamaican people have their own language or dialect, whatever way you want to consider it, of Patois which is already a pidgin of English and West African. Our dialect of BBE borrows from AAVE, but has closer connections with African pidgin and West African patois. Words commonly associated with English culture, such as in it for isn't it, is actually BBE, and not many people know that. My issue with non-black people using black vernacular is that they never receive any repercussions when they do so. They can say BBE words such as bruv, whereas if I was to use the word bruv, I would be seen as ghetto, an intelligent, lower class. Now, the double standard isn't of the non-black people who use this dialect, but more so the people who choose to put black people in a box, despite them acting the exact same way as a non-black person. The perpetrators of this double standard choose to love certain aspects of black culture when it's performed by non-black people, but then get mad when black people have to live it. In terms of AAVE, there have been numerous occasions where I've seen African-American people, you know, publicly scrutinized for using the term on fleek, which is to perfection. But then big corporations such as IHOP can use it for marketing purposes and then receive absolutely no criticism at all. Now for me personally, I am Jamaican. And in Jamaica, our main demographics are Africans, Indians, Portuguese, Chinese, and European. So I'm pretty used to seeing non-black people using black vernacular, hence why I'm not particularly offended. The problem begins when non-black people use black vernacular who haven't got a lived experience within the black community, who then use black vernacular, and then their version of black vernacular, which is easily identifiable to anybody who uses black vernacular on a daily basis, just becomes a hyperbolic representation of black culture. The problem isn't necessarily non-black people sounding black, it's more so when they imitate black people to a point of becoming a caricature of a black person. A caricature that is deeply rooted in racial stereotypes. Now with Miasaurus, we as a community have allowed her to contribute to these harmful stereotypes of the round the way ghetto black girl to the point that it's become a mockery of black people. I mean, sis spoke openly in flagrant disregard for black people and black culture when she detailed her hot Cheeto girl phase. A phase where she acted black. This poses an even bigger problem when we think about the privilege that comes along with being non-black. That you can adopt a black scent for social media clout and entertainment and then drop it when it no longer serves you. Which is what many black people who watched Mia's apology felt. Being black to us is not a costume that we can just take on or off. In all circumstances, when we are in public situations, we are black. And again, the problem isn't non-black people enjoying various aspects of black culture. It's when non-black people don't give black culture the respect that it deserves. Because Mia, to her audience, is seen as extremely humorous. And I don't doubt that for a second. In fact, whilst watching and reviewing her videos, I would say that she is extremely funny and she generated several laughs from me. But I did have to step back and ask myself, is the joke actually what she's saying or the way in which she is saying it. Is black culture the punchline? And had this had been any other accent, say like Chinese or Indian, would the response have been the same? Would we have allowed it? Are we the joke? Because essentially to laugh at black vernacular is to laugh at all of the suffering that came before it. It's more than just a way to say words. It's a way that black folk have retained their culture to navigate through one of the most inhumane acts in history. That's not a joke. I'm not laughing. I'm looking at you, Chet Hanks. Respect, you don't know. That's all far what I got. Booyaka, booyaka! Urgh. In Mia's original
original apology video, she stated that she wanted to be held accountable for her actions and that she did not want the audience to spare her feelings or her emotions as she deserved the repercussions for her actions. And I don't want to run away from taking responsibility either. And I want to hold myself accountable and I want to be that type of person that isn't a fucking piece of shit. Simply. However, many people did not hold her to the exact same standards that they have and would have for any other content creator. And that is in part down to two reasons. Number one, because she got ahead of her pending cancellation slash controversy by apologizing to her audience before the scandal ever arose. And two, because Mia had deleted almost all of her prior content almost an entire year before. First of all, I don't think that there is anything commendable about getting ahead of a controversy. I mean, this is what PR companies have been doing for centuries. It essentially just takes the sting out of the exposure. I mean, just think about when Nikki Tutorials came out as trans ahead of somebody outing her in January 2020. She took the power back from her detractors by using her own voice to tell her truth. Now, in that situation, it's entirely commendable because her business regarding her gender identity is honestly nobody else's business but her own. And it has no real impact or bearings on anybody's life at all. However, in Mia's case, getting ahead of a scandal is actually a lot more manipulative as the shock surrounding her exposure lies with her. The audience is actually left distracted by the prospect of, well, at least she outed herself. To actually really spend any time thinking about all of the various different communities and people, it is that she's actually hurt. Plus, at that point, Mia had deleted all previous story time videos, as well as some commentary videos, stating that she deleted everything that she didn't have a contractual obligation to keep on her channel, i.e. sponsorship videos. Which doesn't make any sense now considering Sis has deleted her whole entire channel, including those said sponsorship videos that she was contractually obligated to keep, but I digress. So it was pretty difficult for her audience and commentators like myself alike to actually go back and cross-reference old videos and see old behavior to decipher real change. I for one believe that deleting all previous videos was not the accountability that Mia stated that she wanted to achieve. It was in fact a way to run away from pending controversy because Mia knew that if people were to actually take a look at her old content, her previous conduct and her current commentary videos, that she would need to hold herself accountable and to the same standards that she set for other people of interest. Hence why, again, I don't see getting ahead of controversy as commendable. Because if Mia really felt bad enough to delete her previous content back in 2021, she also knew the ramifications of her actions and she chose not to face it. But I also think, and it's my little conspiracy here, that deleting old previous videos and content was a way to stop commentators such as myself, because any video that was actually discussing anything to do with Mia at this moment in time has only really been critical analyses of the apologies themselves or just anecdotal recounting of previous content. Because again, it's pretty hard to put together a well-rounded commentary video if you don't have the resources to back up your claims. But by the grace of God, I was able to find the relevant resources because I am a crazy person who wouldn't stop until she got what she needed. So let's do the cross-referencing needed to make an adequate assessment. Okay, so remember I said that we needed to remember the list of admissions it is that Mia Soros had said, we put a pin in it. Okay, cause here's why. We are going to see the importance of Mia getting ahead 
of her current controversy and why she essentially deleted all prior content. Lying about doing drugs, lying about having a particular mental illness, lying about having multiple sex capades, lying about famous people, Melanie Martinez, lying about watching somebody die and not being forthcoming with her racial ambiguity and black scent. Now, in order to take a look at the hypocrisies, we are going to be taking a look at numerous different videos where she essentially waves the opposing finger at other people, requesting that they take accountability for their actions that she herself has made and has not taken accountability for. So let's take a look at the first video. The first video that I believe exemplifies the hypocrisy is her Tanamoja video. The video is titled, Everything Actually Wrong With Tanamoja. Now, Tanamoja was essentially her boss, if you will, for her time while she was with Trash. Because as we discussed earlier, Mia was a contributor to the collaborative channel of Trash. So Mia had somewhat of a vested interest in highlighting the negative behaviors of Tanamoja in order for her to disassociate herself with the brand. So let's take a look at what Mia says in this very brief montage. It's like the racist actions, the scummy behavior for the sake of monetary gain, you know what I'm saying? Like lying, deceiving their audience for the sake of a fake emotional connection why do you still associate with them i'm not here to say tana moja is a horrible person you know i'm not here to pass judgment bitch has suck a hot potato but you know what it's back to school season it's time to pull out the highlighters and emphasize the fact that bare minimum behavior needs to stop being rewarded. There is no such thing as separating the entertainment from the entertainer, okay? The art from the artist. It's just not fair that so many people have had so many things taken away from them because of this adult's countless careless actions, okay? Because who gives a fuck about Facetune and clickbait? What I give a fuck about is everything but. So after highlighting various different things it is that Mia herself can be called out for, she then breaks down Tana's deceitfulness into chapters. Chapter one, Tana Moja filmed a suspected dead body. Days. Filming a not so alive person. Brief summary, her and Shannon Rose, another popular story time YouTuber at the time, spent the day hanging out at the beach and suddenly when they went to go to the woman's bathroom, they opened the door and they saw an overdosed old man lying on the floor that wasn't very live. And to parallel that, Mia Soros lied about watching somebody die. I lied about watching someone die. Chapter two, Tana Mojo profusely lying in her content. Tana Mojo's harmful lies. I'm an extreme over-exaggerator, okay? And that's actually one of the main reasons I used to really like Tana Mojo because some of y'all bitches is just boring, okay? Don't talk about how your bagel dropped on the floor. Let's talk about how the bagel attacked you. But there's a difference between just stretching and flat out pulling a muscle. So let's take a look at some of her torn ligaments. On the parallel, Mia also admitted to lying in her content. I have a problem with compulsive and pathological lying. Chapter three, Tana lied about her interaction with another person of interest. Harmful lie, the content cop. This was low-key defamation, bro. If I was in that position, well, first of all, as a hoe, I would be suing whoever put that position in the Kama Sutra, okay? Not in my... You mean to tell me she completely lied about her and popular YouTuber at the time, iDubbbz's interaction. Parallel to that, Mia Soros lied about having an interaction with another famous person, Melanie Martinez. This entire fabricated story about fighting someone for Melanie Martinez tickets. But the most important thing to know here is that I just lied. And the whole thing was fabricated. Chapter four, Tana Moja does performative activism for people of color. Why completely spin the situation? You know, the only thing that I can really think of is that she wanted to seem like a victim or maybe not necessarily a victim, but at least a witness to extreme racism in action. But you know what? Audience sympathy is powerful especially when you really want to look like the ally that people of color have been waiting for. I'm just like heartbroken. I mean, ditto, Mia, ditto. Chapter five, Tana has gaslit people and has even used black scents. She got mad when Colin called her out and said, hey, you're lying in order to cover up all the racist things you've said in your past. Growing up in Vegas, everybody said those words and I didn't even know that they were considered racist at all. They were in rap songs and I totally thought it just meant like homie or like friend. You know you're a stupid you fuck, girl. Impression of a black woman on joining Chocolate Bunny. Chocolate, Chocolate Bunny. Bunny. Girl. 
Girl, please. I mean, we've discussed this at nauseum. These are only a few examples in this 20 odd minute video, but we can see that Miosaurus had some very strong words to say about Tanamoja. Whilst in tandem in her own video, continuing to perpetuate the black scent, which is also a negative stereotype, and just simply not atoning for her less than perfect behavior, whilst waving the opposing finger at Tana to do better. And the sad thing is, she's not wrong in her video. Like sis makes some great points. It just sucks that Mia's own reckoning didn't take place until almost an entire year later. The next video it is that stood out to me was a video where she speaks about black fishing titled, wait, they're not black. And instantaneously as I hit play on this video, I was hit with an advert for Raycon earbuds. Which was interesting to me because she stated in one of her apology videos that all of the previous contents that she was keeping up on her channel were ones that she actually had contractual obligations to keep up. Now, usually these kind of sponsorship collaborations are requested to keep up for a year. So maybe she had a short, small contract with Raycon, who knows? But at this point, I don't know whether to believe Mia at all because this particular video is a very damning video indeed. The premise of this video was essentially racial appropriation, which means I'll let her explain. First and foremost, let's discuss the actual meaning of cultural appropriation since that's the whole basis of today's video. And I figured that I should be fair since Jesse doesn't want to be. But the definition that I'll be going by today is the act of taking elements from a particular culture for profit or aesthetic without paying respects to the actual origin. So long story short, not good. Mia has exemplified all of these traits and even admitted to doing so. I exaggerated the way that I talked. I changed the way that I talked intentionally at times. There are times nowadays where it still slips out. I have made a caricature of black people a big part of my brand online. So again, Mia, knowing her own behavior, condemned other people for doing the same. Are we seeing a pattern yet? Next up is her video on Trisha Paytas titled, So what actually is wrong with liking Trisha Paytas? Mia has actually made two videos on Trisha Paytas, one that I unfortunately couldn't find, and that one was titled, Trisha, mental illness is not an excuse for that. Now in this video, so what is actually wrong with liking Trisha Paytas? Mia again heavily focuses on Trisha Paytas's racial profiling and stereotyping of black people. And then further goes ahead to talk about Trisha's misrepresentation of mental illness when she quote unquote faked several different mental disorders by using and quote outdated mental stereotypes. I mean, play the clips. Being exposed to black culture and then feeling an affinity for it is like one thing, but then she just completely minimized the N word. Like it was just some internet explorer tab that she didn't want her boss to see. If a word's in a song lyric or if it's in a script, why can't I say that? Now all of a sudden our society has become so sensitive, like so sensitive. So when I'm jamming, I'm jamming with my friends to Nicki Minaj or NWA, whoever it is, like I have to stop because I'm white. Like I can't, I can't sing songs because I'm white, which I was saying, that feels racist to me. Like you're not white, so you can't sing that song. She also made a song called Jungle Fever. I'm gonna let the clips do the talking. Yeah, I said clips, okay? Nicki Minaj said Roman Reloaded. Bitch, the gun is Italy. Yo, whether or not Trisha has DID, she spread tons of misinformation about the disorder and also it was all based on outdated stereotypes. Yo, like go. And the final video, which I personally believe is the proverbial nail in the coffin, was her video on Jenna Marbles titled did Jenna Marbles do anything wrong? Well, dot, 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 yes. Which for all intents and purposes, I actually agree with. But so about eight months ago, Jenna Marbles made a video in which she said she was about to be leaving the internet forever. And I know the moment it dropped, we all said, bitch, five second rule, it's not too late. But when I say we, remember, that I don't speak French. You see, I was really shocked the moment that those words left her mouth, but as the video progressed, it became very clear to me that Jenna was just overrun with a lot of guilt about her past on YouTube. And when she started to explain what her mistakes were, I mean, 
Y'all know why I avoid red meat, talking about miss steaks. Irregardless, many people were really upset that their favorite creator just decided to drop everything in really what felt like an instant. And that's exactly when the conversation started to go south. Yes, I also hate the flavor of talking. Cancel culture took away one of the unproblematic greats yet again. Hold up, unproblematic? Yet again, bitch. We about to read Jack and Jill three times. I said, well, well, well. Woman's just explained that she did blackface and monetized from it for years. I think that's pretty straightforward because, I mean, it's not June. But it's like, I don't know. It's like she mirrored Jenna's own apology video and got ahead of her controversy. And I think she made some points and told her audience these exact same points, but her audience are now choosing to treat her differently because instead of Jenna, she is their unproblematic fave. But again, these are the same fans who are attacking POC content creators who have voiced their opinion on this subject and basically telling them to shut up move on and get over it look at the comments left on my video commenting on a creator admitting to doing very very problematic things okay context i'm not a drama channel or a commentary channel on youtube i literally talk about my life and give people advice so this is just my opinion that got people so riled up mind you this girl's whole channel is her opinion and being harsh and riling people up but anyway i digress We've got the reoccurring, I'm not black, but I can sympathize for her. We've got the, you should have kept this in the drafts. How dare you cancel my fave? She has more followers than you. Angry black woman response for 10,000, Bob. We've got the bitter black woman response. I need to get light in my heart. Okay. That I'm reaching. That this is just another American nonsense. Then maybe y'all non-Americans should stay out of our business and stop trying to talk like us. <laughs> and profiting on it without not even knowing any of the trauma behind it. Again, Mia isn't commendable for coming clean. She just didn't get exposed, whereas the people it was that she was commenting on were currently canceled. And she hopped on to tell them to do better, something it is that she couldn't do herself. <laughs> So, was the second apology any better? No. She rambled on for an additional 40 minutes. She started strong and then ended with this like really weird reintroduction to herself that literally nobody asked for. Kind of ran away from letting people know things about me. Um, I currently live in Finland. Uh, I'm moving to Paris soon. I love fashion, specifically Rick Owens. Um, Rick Owens and Tyrone Dillon, his boyfriend. I probably my special interests, uh, as well as his wife, Michelle Lamy. Um, it seemed as if she took notes from what other commentators had said or advised her to do. And I guess she tried her best, but for many, it still missed the mark. She mentions donating part of her AdSense for each video every month to black charities. And initially I thought that this was a great idea. However, one creator, called Mika SF made a beautiful point about the redistribution of wealth versus the redistribution of your platform, which is what essentially Mia had generated through her negative behavior is a huge and large platform that many people probably won't even see in their lifetimes. Take a look. Like what you should be doing instead, I think if you're a content creator and you're in her shoes and maybe this is just a stupid solution and some people will think it's a terrible idea. That's quite possible, that's fine. But I think what she should be doing is collabing with like a POC, maybe probably a black female creator because of the black set that she had adopted, talking about the, co that the commentary community and the misuse of it. Platform directly people that support the thing that you believe in. And then she equates, this is just her equating money as action. Because she, in her head, she profited off of it. Thus, she must redirect the profits. I think you created a platform off of it and you should redirect the platform because everybody can see the platform stuff, but the, where the money's going depends on the charities. So what's happened since then? Well, Mia has deleted her entire channel. Her channel now has absolutely nothing on it, not even a channel photo, not a background, no nothing. And the channel has now been renamed to channel and name. Now, in one of Mia's apology videos, she said this. And 
I evaded and I ran and I hid and that was wrong too. And I don't want to do that shit anymore. And I don't want to be that person. I need to sit with that and absorb that. So why is she running? It's so annoying to me that she is not growing in the way that she promised she would. She hid away from controversy and decided that she just couldn't take it anymore. The condemnation that she requested from her audience. So I need to reflect and really think and soak it in and feel the shame and guilt and embarrassment and hear uh, people tell me whatever they need to say. Um, everyone has a right to be mad and angry and disappointed and blame me. Wasn't allowed to flow. She decided to once again, take off the proverbial costume and walk away. Leaving 1.1 million people thinking, huh? And any trust that her audience had or any belief that she would dig deep and try harder to fight against the person she was, was gone. Because in her one time of facing the music, she did what she already professed to us that she always does. And she ran away. She ran away from her past transgressions. She ran away from her lies. And now it seems to be that she is currently running away from the truth and hiding from her past. And I'm not saying that Mia is above growth. I believe that growth is showing up for yourself every single day, despite your past. Growth is seeing the person it is that you used to be and generating and creating new bonds as the person you want to be. Growth is owning up to your past and living in your truth. And Mia's truth? Well, Mia seems to me like she is having an extreme identity crisis. And just like her audience, I will await with bated breath to see the person that she chooses to be. Oh my god thank you guys so much for bearing with me over the past two weeks whilst i get this video together this has been a hard one man i am gonna trip this has been a long video to get together but i really wanted to say thank you to all of the other content creators who actually gave me information and helped me out the voodoo child check out her video she got she got railed so badly by me as audience and she did not deserve it as a black woman she is 100% entitled to her voice. So definitely go and check out her content. Mika SF, I just discovered her. Like, I'm going on like I discovered somebody, but I just discovered her content and I'm like, girl, she's like, you know that thought provoking content that I'm trying to do over here? She's doing it, she's out here doing it. So definitely go and check out her channel as well. I really appreciate both of these content creators contributions. Um, also, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to my Patreons as well as my members and all the Twitch family. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. And with that being said, I hope you guys have an amazing day or evening, whatever the hell it is you're doing. Oh, and a massive thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's video. And until next time, you beautiful, amazing, badass bitches. These Iceberg Explained videos are going to become like a normal thing. I'm just going to let you know now. This is the thing, right? This is the thing I'm doing right now, okay? Tell me who you want me to do an Iceberg on. <laughs> Bye.